As you have heard, President Joe Biden with a strongly worded address, some pointed remarks uh, against uh, Russia and uh, the uh, regime of, of Vladimir Putin. One thing that uh, you will have noticed at the end of that uh, address there, there were a lot of unanswered questions, obviously. You could hear the noise from the reporters in the room clamoring to be heard over one another. And so that uh, begs more questions here on the home front as well. Uh, we're going to be joined now by an expert on Ukraine. He is uh, Professor Paul Post. He is a uh, professor, associate professor, of uh, graduate uh, studies at UIC. Professor Post, good afternoon and welcome to CBS2. Thank you for joining us. Well, we have uh, some pretty weighty issues to discuss here today with you, and uh, not the least of which is uh, over the past hours here in the last uh, 24 hours or so, what on earth is going on over there? Basically, you know, you can't cut it down to any more elementary parts than that. What happened? Why is it happening? And where is it going? So things are moving very fast, as you just indicated. Um, and I think you could tell the extent to which people are surprised, people are shocked by just the very nature of the questions that President Biden received. But what's happening is exactly what President Biden said, is that Putin has had designs for a long time on Ukraine, even though events are transpiring very quickly right now. Of course, this has been kind of a slow roll. There's been this buildup over a few months of troops there, and now they are launching their attack. And the objective, apparently given the extent given the size of the attack is to conquer ukraine now there's questions about what will happen after that and of course that was raised during the press conference but that is what's happening right now is russia has an objective of capturing ukraine conquering ukraine and a big reason why is because putin has designs of wanting to if you will reestablish the russian empire well, Putin has had some pretty fiery rhetoric here going into this, uh, leading up to this, uh, talking about the United States and our empire of lies over here, that uh, he believes that the Western bloc countries uh, that aspire to be like us also are uh, built upon lie after lie after lie. Now, how can we trust that after we've seen the president of, of Russia go completely against his word? Where are we going from here with that? How, how can we trust anything that is being said on the, on the side of Russia? This is very much the concern, which I think even President Biden indicated that he has no way of knowing exactly what Putin is seeking to do other than what he can observe right now, which is that Russia has launched this invasion. But in terms of the extent to which not only does Putin's ambitions lie, but also the extent to which he's willing to pursue those. I think those are the open questions right now. And the rhetoric that you're referring to is exactly what makes people concerned. And that's the type of rhetoric that would lead one to think that Putin is willing to incur very harsh penalties in order to achieve, achieve his objectives because he just simply doesn't trust the West. Well, I heard uh, earlier today, we all uh, tuned in to uh, NATO and uh, the uh, address by uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg about uh, the uh, NATO's collective defense commitment to other countries. So again, Article 5, you attack one, you've attacked everybody. How on earth can everybody feel as though we are not going to be getting into a direct conflict with Russia when you have that article laid upon the table and everybody has sworn to defense NATO territories and yet we're entering essentially one who's a friend of NATO. So how are we going to how are we going to go forward from that? I think the key part of it is really what President Biden has said. I mean, even more so than the language he just used, he used the language in an earlier address last week where he talked about NATO Article 5 being sacrosanct. But a key thing about the article, I think this is really important to keep in mind, is that the article does indeed commit the members to defending one another if there's an attack. But it goes on to say in a manner that each member deems appropriate. So each member is allowed to decide what are the actions that they will take in defense. And so that's why the key is not so much the Article 5 commitment itself. It's what President Biden has said, and what he has said is that U.S. troops, U.S. military forces would be used if Russia actually attacks a NATO ally, be it Poland 
or probably most likely the Baltic states. Well, there you go. That, that, that's an important aspect of that article, uh, force deemed appropriate. So that is a good caveat to understand and uh, give the rest of us out here uh, a little bit of comfort in knowing that uh, we're not going to be heading whole headedly into some sort of a, a head on conflict uh, with Russia. Now, why on earth would Putin put himself in such a compromised position, knowing that uh, there's things going on at home, he's got his own issues uh, on his side of the border, and now all of a sudden he seems to be mixing it up with the entire European Union. Why on earth would he do that? There's two possible explanations for why Putin could potentially take these actions beyond just Ukraine. One could be one could be that he simply views the attack on Ukraine as being very simple, very easy, that it ends up going well. And this could build overconfidence in his ability and in Russia's ability to be able to use force abroad. That would be one scenario. The other scenario, and one that looks quite likely, especially given the nature of the economic sanctions that are being imposed, is he could in, he could engage in what we refer to in the discipline as a gamble for resurrection. In other words, you're in a scenario that's kind of a no lose, like a no win scenario, no lose scenario. Your back is against the wall, you're incurring economic hardship, you're fe facing military threats, and you feel like you have nothing left to do but lash out. And that would be, I think, an even more likely scenario of, that could lead Putin to actually attack one of the NATO allies as he feels like he has no other choice but to lash out. Well, obviously here, uh, from what we've seen in the, in the not too recent past here has been uh, ever escalating rhetoric on the part of the Russian president. Um, how do you think it's being viewed at home on the Russian side of the border? Uh, Obviously, we, we've got a, a culture there that is used to military service, military action. Same thing with the citizens of Ukraine, that uh, they basically, unfortunately, had to grow used to uh, military forces being in the field and among them. How, how is it being viewed there? I sense, based on the work that some of my colleagues at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs have done, where they do a lot of work on global on uh, public opinion foreign policy in the U.S. and abroad, my sense is that there's a lot of division within the Russian public regarding this. I think there is a certain segment of the Russian public that does hold a view that Ukraine should be part of Russia. There's very much a, a view of kind of a longing for the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union. There is definitely a segment like that. But I think there's a greater segment of the Russian population that would prefer not to do this. They would like to have more of a pro-Western sure. view towards things. The key, though, is not so much what the Russian public wants. It's what are the people around Putin? What are they saying? And one thing that's been a constant since the end of the Cold War is there very much there is very much a hawkish camp within the Russian foreign policy elite. By hawkish, meaning they have an anti-Western view, they have a pro-reestablishment of the Soviet Union view. They use a phrase called the near abroad to describe the former Soviet republics. And I think they are the ones who have the most influence. They are the ones who Putin primarily listens to. That's another uh, important aspect. Behind the scenes in the Putin administration, um, how many different factions are there? Uh, ever since the end of the Cold War, we've seen a lot of these uh, states just kind of drifting apart. It's not the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics anymore. We've uh, lost the, uh, the, the eastern, uh, the, the border. Uh, and that came down. So they have to be feeling a little bit uh, vulnerable, don't they? to uh, Western I mean, influence? Absolutely. I think that you, I think this is a big reason why Putin has always referred to, say, NATO expansion as being one of his main reasons for having, um, if you will, a dispute with the West, is saying that NATO went against its promise to never expand to the East. But I really think that that's just a useful target for him to point to, is NATO expansion. He's also had this view towards the EU, and I think it's for the reasons that you're highlighting, which is that a lot of these former Soviet republics look at their opportunities as being greater if they join, say, the West through NATO, through the European Union, basically if they follow the model, the model of the Baltic states. Of course, the Baltic states were also part of the former Soviet Union, but they were able to join NATO, they were able to join the EU, and they have prospered. And I think that a lot of these other states, most notably Ukraine, see that and want that, and that indeed does put Russia 
in a tough situation. Do you think he might be doing this purely out of a strategic uh, initiative here to actually gain more ground uh, in, in try and combat the, the fact that he possibly could be losing more territory as uh, Ukraine is being independent and going over towards NATO and uh, therefore seeing what's left of his Russia shrink? I think that that's absolutely the case that in his mind, he views that he doesn't have any other choices. I think that if you look at the policies he's pursued, he has definitely been willing to use military force. He used it against Georgia in 2008. Of course, he took Crimea from Ukraine in 2014. Now, in that case, it was a what we call a fait accompli. The soldiers went right in. There were no shots fired. But he's definitely been willing to use military force. However, he's also been interested in using, with if you will, more asymmetric means or even more diplomatic means. So if you look at, for example, the relationship that Russia has with Belarus, they have a very strong relationship. Belarus is absolutely within the Russian orbit, it is, if you will, a, a state that is very beholden to Putin's views. And I think that in an ideal world for Putin, if every one of the former Soviet republics were like Belarus in that sense, he would have no reason to use force. But the reality is they're not, and so hence he feels like this is the next option. Well, Putin, the president himself, is ex-KGB, so you would think that uh, he's used to force meeting force, basically, and that's the most elementary way that he can deal with any kind of threat outside his borders. Absolutely. I think that this is, he, he is not afraid to shy away from it. I think the ex-KGB element is important because, obviously, as being part of that agency, you would be aware of the multiple ways in which you could obtain what you're seeking, such as using, well, in the case of nowadays, cyber techniques, cyber tactics, of being able to use misinformation campaigns, disinformation campaigns, that there are other tools that you can use in order to be able to subvert or undermine a rival. I feel like in Putin's view, he doesn't see those as being effective any longer, and so that is why he's now turning to military force. And basically what, what we're seeing here uh, with uh, President Putin is the fact that he's a very hands-on person as, as far as uh, Russian leadership is concerned. He seems to have his hands in every, every pie under, underneath uh, his, uh, in his purview. So uh, basically he's, he's going to be controlling whatever goes on over there. It, it begins and ends at the top, correct? Absolutely. This is about Putin. Now, as I indicated he does have, if you will, a entourage of individuals. He has people that he listens to. However, I think as was on full display the other day on Monday, and President Biden referred to this during his remarks, you could see that his these individuals that comprise what he calls the what they call the Security Council for Russia, they very much just kind of told Putin what he wanted to hear. They all got up and gave reasons for invading Ukraine, almost in like a show to kind of say that Putin wanted to be convinced of why he needed to invade Ukraine. But the reality is they were just simply telling Putin what he wanted to hear. So I think your point is right on that. At the end of the day, it is about Putin and what Putin wants and what Putin thinks. Well, a couple more questions before we wrap it up here, uh, Professor. What does it mean for us economically on this side of the ocean? So I think President Biden was very open about that, that there will be economic hardships. Um, this is something that we've seen coming. This is something I've referred to uh, prior to today that you would expect to see oil prices going up, most notably because Russia is a major oil producer. And that's going to have an effect not just in oil markets, but also other commodity markets. Of course, market instability, this is going to be a big factor. The markets are going to go up and down, down, all around, anytime there's massive uncertainty, which of course what we're witnessing right now is producing that. If anything, maybe where there is a bright spot is as this goes on, it will start to settle down. It'll become more clear what is happening and that could allow markets to stabilize. But in the short term, there's definitely going to be economic hardships. The other angle to it will be what is the, if you will, blowback from our sanctions? Could our sanctions end up eventually having some harm on European economies as well as U.S. economy? A good example of this of how it could have implications for the Europeans economically is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Of course, Germany cut that off, but Germany was working on that because that would be a key part of their economy. That would be something their economy needs. But they're willing to cut that off in order to be able to show resolve against Russian aggression. 
Well, one last question, uh, Professor, before we let you go, uh, and this is probably the one thing that's in the back of everybody's mind, is that we have a major nuclear power which has uh, now uh, introduced or reintroduced aggression onto the European continent, and uh, sides seem to be getting polarized here. Uh, could this go nuclear? What's interesting about this is what several people who I follow who are experts on nuclear weapons have said, which is that the prospects of this going nuclear are actually, I still think, quite low. Though, obviously, there's still a reason why the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists here in Chicago still have the doomsday clock close to midnight. There's always this prospect for nuclear war. But I think what this is actually showing is that due to the science being sufficiently concerned about the use of nuclear weapons, that they're willing to do quite a bit at the conventional level. So you could, there's actually quite a great risk for a large-scale conventional war, largely because the sides are afraid to use nuclear weapons. And so I don't think the prospects of using nukes are high. It's always there. But I do think that due to the sides recognizing that each other are afraid to use the nukes, they might be more willing to use and go further with their conventional forces. Yes, indeed. There's a lot of uh, new conventional weaponry, and there, it's being reinvented and, and improved, if you will. That's kind of a, a misnomer there, because anytime you improve a weapon, it actually is worse for everybody, the end user there. So, uh, Professor Paul Post from the University of Illinois at Chicago, thank you very much for your input today. And uh, let's uh, keep uh, up to date here and uh, keep in touch, and uh, we will follow the Ukrainian situation as it uh, plays out. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.